in this part, we want to take a closer look at the logistic growth function, and we want to understand why we have an S-curve. Here, we're going to graph the function. Now, our function itself, we're going to have a population at time t, given by this expression. R and K are positive constants. K is our carrying capacity. C is going to be another positive constant. So with these conditions, the graph that comes out is going to be an S-curve. Now, we could just take the first and second derivatives of this function, do all our work from calculus, and then that'll give us our graph. Here, I'm going to use the logistic differential equation to get our graph instead. Now, our logistic differential equation is going to be given by p prime equals r times p times 1 minus p over k. If we let k get large without bound, then this term is just going to turn to a 1, and then we're looking at the differential equation for exponential growth. So all we're doing is we're taking the equation for exponential growth, and then we're going to put on a limit on the size of the population. Now, our first step, I'm going to need an inequality. So what I want to have is, if I take 1 over 1 plus a positive number, that's always between 0 and 1. To show this, that's just manipulating inequalities. If you just want to believe it, put in some numbers. So try a half, 1, 2. Whatever positive number you use, it's always going to be true. Now, if I take 1 over 1 plus c times e to the minus rt. c is positive. e to anything is always positive. So I'm going to have 1 over 1 plus a positive number. So that's going to be between 0 and 1. If we multiply through by k, what comes out is going to be between 0 and k. So our function is always going to be between 0 and k. All right. Let's check our first derivative. So r is positive. p is a population, so that's always positive. 1 minus p over k. Well, since p is less than k, this number is less than 1. So 1 minus it is going to be a positive number. So p prime is always greater than 0. So that means p is always increasing. Let's take a look at concavity. Here. We're interested in the second derivative. If we take the logistic differential equation, take the derivative of both sides, that gives us, on the left-hand side, I have the second derivative. On the right-hand side, I apply the product rule. When we simplify, we're going to get r times p prime times 1 minus 2p over k. If I want to look for inflection points, I set that equal to 0. So we could take out the r. I can multiply this through by k. That's going to give me p prime times k minus 2p equals 0. We've already seen that p prime is always positive. So that leaves us with p equal to k over 2. So the only way I can have the second derivative equal to 0 is if the value of our function is k over 2. That leaves us with two possibilities. In the first case, our initial population, p0, is greater than or equal to k over 2. Since our function is increasing, there's no way I can come back to the value k over 2 at a later date. So there's no way we can have the second derivative equal to 0 if t is greater than 0. So that means there are no inflection points. In the second case, we'll have the initial population, p0, less than k over 2. So here we're going to see we'll have an inflection point when t is equal to natural log of c divided by r. Let's check out regions of concavity now. So we know the only way we can have the second derivative equal to 0 is if the value of our function is k over 2. So we split into two cases. For the first case, let's consider points where our function is greater than k over 2. 
Now, that's the same as saying that 2p is greater than k. If we look at our equation for the second derivative, we have r times p prime, that's always positive. Then if I take 1 minus 2p over k, since 2p is greater than k, we're going to have this is less than 0. So the second derivative is less than 0, which means when the value of our function is greater than k over 2, that means we're concave down. Same argument says if your function is less than k over 2, you're going to be concave up. Let's look at the graphs of our function. In the first case, we have that our initial population is greater than or equal to k over 2. That means c is between 0 and 1, including 1. On a region, we're going to be increasing and concave down. If we take the limit of our function as t goes to infinity, we'll have a horizontal asymptote at y equals k. So if we put everything together, our graph is going to have this shape. Now, that doesn't look like an S-curve. It actually is if we allow for negative values of t. So if I have c between 0 and 1, if we take the natural log, we get a negative number. So that'll say the inflection point is back here somewhere. Okay, it's also worth noting, if we're considering negative values of t, if we take the limit as t goes to minus infinity, we're going to have the horizontal asymptote at 0. So this is going to go over, down, and then go off to meet up with the x-axis. In our second case, the initial population is going to be less than k over 2, so somewhere down here. So that means c is going to be greater than 1. Now, here we're going to have an inflection point at natural log of c over r. And we know at that point, the value of the function is going to be k over 2. So we have a definite point on our graph. We've seen that we're increasing everywhere. And then on each side of our inflection point, we'll have concave up if the value of our function is less than k over 2, concave down if the value of our function is greater than k over 2. When we put that together, we get our S-curve. OK, as a check, if I take the natural log of c, if c is greater than 1, that's going to give me a positive number. So the inflection point is going to have a positive t value. Now let's show that our inflection point occurs when t is equal to natural log of c over r. We want to know where the second derivative is equal to 0. We've already shown that that will occur when p of t is equal to k over 2. So take our expression for p of t, set it equal to k over 2. The k's are going to cancel. We can cross multiply to get the equation 1 plus c e to the minus rt is equal to 2. So in this equation, I want to isolate e to the rt. Now, I can move the 1 to the other side. In that resulting equation, I'm going to push the e to the minus rt to the other side by multiplying both sides by e to the rt. So I'll send this term to a 1, and then we have e to the rt over here. I've isolated e to the rt, so I can take natural log of both sides. Then I use the rule that natural log of e to the box is equal to box. So when I apply natural log to the right-hand side, I get r times t. On the other side, we have natural log of c. We divide both sides by r, that gives us our equation for the t value of the inflection point. Now, let's note, if I have c greater than 1, if I go over to the graph of natural log, that's going to mean the value that comes out is going to be positive. So if our t value is positive, the inflection point is on the positive t axis, that means we're looking at an s-curve. If I have c between 0 and 1, take the natural log, it's going to give me a negative value. So that means t will be less than 0. That will mean the inflection point is on the negative t axis. So if we're only looking at t greater than 0, we won't see the inflection point and we don't see the s-curve.